All right. Now, because the, the, the new challenge for this month is on baptisms and trying to get, encourage people to get baptized, I wanted to preach a sermon that has something to do with, with baptism, but not just the standard, you know, who should get baptized, when they should get baptized, and everything else. I've taught that a, a few times already, and to be honest with you, I don't want to do it again. I'd rather just have you, if you don't, if you don't know that already, go back and listen to one of those sermons uh, for now. I will end up re-preaching sermons like that in the future, but it wasn't something that I was uh, too excited about preaching on tonight. So I actually decided to preach on something that's close, similar with, with baptism. We're going to get a little bit more and a, a few other questions about baptisms a little bit later in the sermon. But um, what I'm preaching on tonight, I'm preaching against, is this false doctrine of the Baptist briders. Who's heard of, of Baptist, like a Baptist bride or Baptist brider churches before? You heard about it before? I'm going to and, and I'm, not, I'm not an expert on their doctrine, so I, I, I looked up and kind of studied out more. I've dealt with some people that were Baptist writers in the past, so I'm going to be more speaking to my experience talking with people than might necessarily be exact, established theology of you know, landmark Baptist church, or whatever. So one of the things you'll find is that there's landmark is associated with people who believe Baptist brothers. And there's a, it's not just one church. It's a, there, you know, you'll find a lot of landmark missionary Baptist churches or landmark Baptist churches are churches that will follow this Baptist brighter doctrine. And from my reading and my understanding of the history, this is a group that was part of the Southern Baptist Convention they're Baptist believers, but they, they, they ended up, they were trying to change the, the convention, but they ended up then having to withdraw because of their beliefs. So the, the, you know, other people were rejecting their beliefs, so they ended up withdrawing. Now, one of the reasons why I'm even bringing this up and preaching about it is because there are some things that they believe that we also hold to. And, and this, there's, you know, it's easier to get caught up in false doctrine when you've got some other common ground that you can you could kind of tie together and bridge some gaps. So these churches are going to be KJV only churches, right? They're Baptist churches. There's going to have a lot, and you know I'm not even saying that they're that they're unsaved, right? Now many of them are because I what, from what I've seen, a lot of them seem to be very Calvinistic. And just and, and very just very very Calvinistic, but I can't I can't speak for all of them, so I'm not I'm not trying to paint this too broad. Also, I have limited experience, so you know I don't want to go too broad on that. But um, some of their their main tenets and one of the the reasonings for them splitting from the Southern Baptist Convention also were good in the sense that you know for again for based on my reading, it's they didn't want to have like recognize all these various pap pastors from like different denominations and just having them come into church. Like they didn't think it was right to just allow all different variety of, of pastors to come in just because they were called themselves Christian and just come in and preach behind the pulpit. Look, amen to that. Yeah. Where you have to have standards of what even constitutes a legitimate church, what constitutes, you know, who's going to be allowed to come in and preach behind the pulpit. So there's definitely reason and concern to to make distinctions and to, and to cause separation. But one of the things you'll notice as we get into this and what I think their biggest problem is that they, they have some, some decent principles, but they, they end up taking things way too far to the point of becoming cultish. And, and as we get into it, hopefully I'll be able to elaborate on that a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, they also reject the, the, the universal church, the concept of there being an invisible universal church that every Christian is a part of. So, and this is huge because we, we believe exactly the same thing here. We reject the teaching of a universal church, which another word for universal is Catholic, by the way, just so you're aware of that, that the, the Catholic church, like you know, the, the Catholic church that exists today, that's existed for a long time, it literally means the universal church. And, I mean, you want to talk about ecumenical type of a sounding church, right? It's universal. That is what they're about. And we believe 
that the church, because the word church literally means congregation, so you can't have a universal church comprised of all believers in Jesus Christ when you're not congregated together. It, just, it, it doesn't add up. It doesn't compute. It doesn't make any sense. It's a contradiction of terms. The problem, though, is that people don't understand that, that, word, that the word church is synonymous with a congregation. And so you just have this, this idea floating around that, oh, well, we're all, because what they'll say is we're all part of the body of Christ. And lose sight of the fact that when the Bible's talking about a church, and even talks about the church, it's talking about individual churches. Just like when the Bible talks about the husband or the wife, like, it's not like there's only one husband ever. There's, there's other husbands, there's other wives, but it's, it's referring to, in context, you know, the husband in general or the church in general, right? So um, I don't want to get too far off into that because they reject the universe. It's not a term about the universal church, but many denominations accept that Catholic church. I know I grew up as Presbyterian, which I, I just consider Catholic light, but we would recite, I was forced to memorize the Apostles' Creed which says, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. I mean, literally, that, that is one of the things I had to chant and recite and memorize that we believe in. And of course, in, in when we memorized it, they had like universal in parentheses, just letting you know that that's what Catholic means. But it's like we're Protestants saying, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church because Catholic means universal. So, and that is what Presbyterians believe. And that is what many different denominations believe. That's what, you know, the vast majority, I would say, of Christian denominations will believe in the, the concept of having, even Baptists will believe in this concept of having, you know, this universal, invisible body of Christ that everyone's a member of. And, um, but they don't believe in that. So here's, you know, they're KJV only, or I, I assume they're KJV. I know, I know that they, they list the KJV as being you know, the inerrant word of God. They reject the universal church. We do the same thing. They have other, um, they have standards for what requires a church to be a legitimate church, but their idea of what's a legitimate church is different, um, way different than what we would consider. And this is where they start getting into like church genealogies, if you will, of going back and what they, what they believe in is this Baptist succession, right? And this is very similar to what the Catholic Church believes. You know, if you talk to the Catholic, they'll tell you, well, they, we're the church that started with, you know, the Apostle Peter was the first pope, and, you know, we have this continuity of churches that exist that goes all the way back to the disciples, and, you know, we can prove it, and, and they kind of rely heavily on that. Now, I want to be very clear and careful in how and what I say because I do believe that people who have beliefs like ours have always existed since the time of Christ and churches that can, you could consider similar to ours in mind and spirit and doctrine have always existed as well. And that there, there is linkage from churches beginning other churches I don't think that we can just go back through history and just make those actual, connect all those dots. One is because, I mean, the Baptist name hasn't been, you know, a Baptist church hasn't always even been what people have been called. And, you know, these people would say the same thing. And if you've ever seen, who's ever seen that booklet, The Trail of Blood? Lots of Baptist churches use that. And I'm not saying anything you know, necessarily bad about that. I don't, I don't know the validity of the data in, in that. I don't know whether it's true or false. I haven't done my own research and studying the history. I mean, I'm not saying it's false. So, but it does kind of explain the concept of what I already believe. Anyways, it has to, you know, you have to have some type of succession of believers getting other believers saved and other, you know, and church being spawned and started. But here's where I draw the line and where I'm not going to say like, and where I think these people go way overboard is you almost have to, like, they have to have this almost like a proof of pedigree that, well, I came, that we, at least in America, you can trace back to these founding churches to even be considered like a legitimate church, even in God's eyes. That like, well, if you can't show 
well, this person went to this person, this this person, this person, then we're not going to, you know, you're not recognized as a legitimate church, which to me is just kind of ridiculous to make that type of, um, you know, to be able to have to trace yourself back. And that closely resembles, you know, the Jews who want to look at their genealogy. Well, are you really a child of Abraham? Right. And the, and the, the Bible tells us, the Bible warns us in First Timothy chapter one, uh, verse number three. As I besought thee to abide still, just stay in Revelation 19, as I, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. So the Bible is saying to avoid genealogies. Why avoid genealogies? Because they just bring up more doubt and more questions, right? And more strivings and everything else. And this trying to go back and, and do some church history searches and doing these genealogy searches is going to bring up the same, you know, you can say, oh, but this is talking about physical genealogies. Okay, but it's the same exact concept and problem that you're going to run into, whether you're looking up a, a, you know, a whole body, a church, or an individual. doesn't matter. It's going to bring up the same problems, and we should avoid those types of things anyways. You ought to be able to judge a church based off of what they're preaching and what they're teaching and compare that to the Bible. And here's the other thing, too, when it comes to determining what's legitimate and what's not. You know, obviously, the Bible spells out how to do things. And, and there are certain doctrines that I'll hold to as this is what's right and this is how you do things. But it doesn't mean that churches couldn't have started in an incorrect way, but still be considered legitimate churches in God's eyes. Right? Just because things weren't done the way, exactly the way that he is going to tell you it has to be, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I'm, and obviously we're going to say, no, it needs, you know, things, if we're going to start a church or do anything, we're going to do things according to the Bible. But if you're going to look back into history, you know, you can't just say, well, they just aren't because of whatever and come up with, with extra biblical reasons or just using logic to, to deduce. One of the things that we saw when we went through our list of um, churches in the, in the book of Revelation was that they had a lot of problems, yet they were still considered to be legitimate churches. I mean, one even had a prophetess, Jezebel, right? that was causing people to commit fornication, real bad problem in the church, and they were still considered a legitimate church in God's eyes. But I mean, you say, but the Bible says I suffer not a woman to teach, but to be in, you know, it's like, yeah, I know, I agree. And that's wrong. But here's a church that had a female preacher, that had a, you know, and they were still considered a legitimate church in God's eyes. I mean, they were. Now they're about to lose their candlestick, but so you, you get what I'm saying here. We can't be, you, you got to be able to look at evidence like that and say, let's not be so strict of going back and be like, well, you need to have this perfect pedigree or else God's not even considering you a church. And this also, what a lot of it stems from, and it's why they're called Baptist briders, is their totally incorrect understanding of the marriage, sup, you know, the marriage feast of the Lamb and just who the bride of Christ is in Scripture. And what they'll say is that other people can be saved as other believers, but you're not going to be, you know, have your special position if you weren't, you know, baptized by a person who's had the hands laid on by this person, by this person, that can trace it back to the apostles, right? That you need to have that, otherwise it's not legitimate, and you need to be in a church that can trace its root, you know, and, and they're real strict on that type of a thing, and they'll say that, um, you know, basically it's the, it's the we're the only true church mentality, which is a very, another dangerous area to get into when you've got a church that's saying, well, I mean, the, the Catholic church, we're the only true church. The Mormons, we're the only true church, right? But you know, you're not going to hear it said here, we're the only true church. Because I don't believe that. Now, the, the church is that I think teach the closest to what's right and biblical and accurate are going to be independent fundamental Baptist churches. That's what I believe. But it doesn't mean there aren't any other churches out there that are also legitimate churches in God's eyes 
teaching good doctrine with saved people in it. Because I don't believe that that's like that. It's only independent. You know, but, but you're going to have your best bet try, you know, finding independent fundamental Baptist churches. And that's been my experience, and that's what I believe. But I don't think that we've got the corner on the truth and being a legitimate church. So when you, when you hear these people saying that, you've got, you got to be careful because that leads you down some very weird doctrinal paths where you have no alternative because if you're part of the only true church, and this is what the only true church is saying, now, now you've just completely closed off any alternative to, to, well, what, you know, is this right? And challenging what's being said. Well, this is the one true church, so this must be right. And that kind of gives them their own credibility and authority as saying, well, if you can establish, like, if it, it, I mean, this is a, a classic cult leader type of a move, is convincing people that you are in the one true church because then you could get away with a lot more. That's, that's a point I'm trying to get across here is that that's the mentality that follows of just saying, well, we've already proven to you that we are the legitimate right church because we set up what it takes to be a le you know, the legitimate true church. We, met, we, we checked all the boxes, so now what we say is true and what other people say are lies. And you can't use that as your authority. You have to use the Bible as your authority for everything. For everything. And be able to challenge your beliefs no matter, you know, no matter who holds other beliefs and determine what's true based on what the Bible says, not on what history says, not on what who's saying it says, but what this word says. So we're going to look at this, um, the marriage supper of the Lamb as well as the bride of Christ. Revelation 19 talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, which takes place basically when Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom on earth. And then we see the bride of Christ mentioned in Revelation chapter 21. So let's look at verse number seven here. The Bible reads, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now jump down to verse 17. I just wanted to get that context of the, the marriage supper of the Lamb being brought up here. Verse 17 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls, that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of, of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So without going through all the context of all these last chapters of Revelation, basically what's happening here is this is after God's done pouring out his wrath. And Jesus is just about to set up his kingdom because the, you know, the beast and the false prophet are being thrown into the lake of fire, right? And Satan's going to be bound in hell for a thousand years. The kingdom's going to be established. And this marriage supper of the lamb is brought up with um, the saints being dressed in white and fine linen here in verse 8 where it says um, and to her talk about the wife of the lamb was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints now um, the reason one of the, the, the big distinctions is that or, or the cause for, for 
people get screwed up about this is just a lack of understanding of the end times events and just who the bride is and who and, and what the you know who's going to be at the marriage supper of the lamb because they'll say people are excluded from this just like the millennial exclusionists who believe in baptist purgatory and that people are going to go to hell for a thousand years they don't understand this also but um there's Go over to Revelation 21 first. I'm trying to, to think about the best way to explain this. It's, it's a simple concept, but... Revelation 19, where it refers to people being dressed in white, fine linen. The reason why the saints have the fine linen is because they've been washed in the blood of Christ. They've been purified and cleansed and sanctified through Jesus Christ not through their own righteousness, not because they've attained unto white linen that they have just completely pure, clean works. It's because of Jesus Christ. So what we're going to find at the marriage supper of the Lamb is all the believers, because they've already been raptured at this point, and they're all going to join Jesus Christ on the earth to rule and reign with him. No one's left out of this. Now, the reason why I'm um, started here is because it's referencing all of these believers being the wife. And then we're going to see in Revelation 21, the bride, which, I mean, this is still referring to the same, the same thing. I mean, there's not, Jesus doesn't have multiple wives, right? You've got the bride of Christ. And... Revelation 21 talks about the new Jerusalem being the bride. Okay, now look at verse number one. The Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then jump down to verse number nine. The Bible says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great uh, a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So you say, well, Pastor Berzins, why, you know, this is describing the new Jerusalem, and then that is definitely being referred to as the bride of Christ. So how can this be where we have the wife as the, the saints? Well, all throughout Scripture, and even just now, I mean, if you, if you think about it, all cities, why are they a city? Why are they, you know, it's, it's because they're comprised of a group of people. And that it's, it's, it's the people ultimately that make the city. Now it's describing, cities have other infrastructure which is being described here with the New Jerusalem. But why is a city, you know, it wouldn't really be a city if it was just completely vacant and empty. The, the whole point of having a city is because people are dwelling there. And when you go back through history and even just the names of places now, very frequently the reason for a, a name of a place is because they're named after a person and the person is one who established and founded that settlement, which became a city, and now we know cities by names. And especially when you're reading through the Bible, you see that over and over and over again. You'll see there's a, you know, there's a literal city or place called Dan. There's a place called, you know, that has these different names. And why is that? Because they're the ones that just went there and settled, and their families grew, and they multiplied, and they became a large people, and they became a nation. I mean, even Israel is the name of one man. But that man whose family grew and kin grew to encompass an entire landmass known as a nation. And these names are named after those people because those are the people who live there. So the bride of Christ is ultimately the people. It's the it's marriage supper, but it's all people. It's all of the believers it's all the people who are sanctified in jesus christ there's not a distinction between you know who's going to be part of you know the wife and who's not and what these people do the baptist briders will say well only 
only some churches, only some believers are going to be at this marriage supper. Only some people are part of the bride of Christ. And that's why they're called Baptist briders because it's talking about the bride. And it's like, no, this new Jerusalem, all believers are going to be there. No, the, you know, the marriage supper, all believers are going to be there because they're all dressed in that white linen. They're all sanctified and um, justified through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, and, and this, a lot of people say, well, well, who cares? End time's not that big of a deal. But the end time stuff can lead into a lot of other doctrines that have a major impact even on your day-to-day -day doctrine and life and church you go to and things like that, when you don't have a good understanding of what's, you know, of, of all scripture, but even the, um, you know, the end times, it, it's easier to be led astray. And these areas like what's going to happen with the bride of Christ and with the marriage of the Lamb, it's easier to get away with a bad teaching on that. But then... You know, people are just confused, they don't understand. But then that leads into other things. And like, like the pre-trib rapture, when people don't understand end times, and I understand why you don't, it's easier to look back than it is to look, to look forward. But in order to believe in a doctrine like the pre-trib rapture, then you have to have some form of like Zionism tied into it or dispensationalism. And, and it gets into these other doctrines because you have to try to make this one fit. Right, so in this case with the Baptist brider, it's just, oh, well, we have this doctrine that they don't fully understand, and then they have to make that fit so they, they, they have to impact other doctrines as well. And that's where it starts to become dangerous because in order to try to reconcile everything in the scripture, uh, when you have a bad doctrine, then um, you have to force fit. Right. And, you know, this ought to be good for everybody to just pay attention to and be aware of when you're deciding what you believe and what doctrines you believe, if you, if you think you found something new and exciting or whatever and, and some new truth, great, but verify that. If it's starting to force you to start making changes in other errors and other doctrines, you want to scrutinize that very, very, very closely and be ready to reject a doctrine that might sound great. It might sound like, oh man, this is super cool and, and you think you have this great revelation. Test it. Try it. Because if, it, if, if, it's, if you're contradicting some of the basic fundamental doctrines that are just real core, real primary, and you have to start changing that, you've got a bad doctrine. And maybe you didn't come up with yourself. Maybe you heard someone else talk about it. Or, you know, Test it out against other things. So when you have to start making changes, oh, well, the elect here, it's really talking about the Jews, and here it's talking about believers, and here it's, you know, it's like, hold on a second, that doesn't sound right. So one of the things that they believe, I already brought this up, they believe in this unbroken chain of Baptist churches going all the way back to the apostles. And this is a point where many briders take things to bizarre extremes. And it has to do with, like, you know, ordinations not being accurate because you can't trace back far enough. Even church membership, you know, who's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And even holding communion. And one of the ways, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is another common doctrine that's held by the Baptist briders is this idea of, of a closed communion or twice closed communion or whatever. There's different, different labels for it. where basically what, what they teach about communion is that if you're not a member of their church, then you cannot participate in communion. So when we do, we do communion here once a year, for those of you that, that aren't aware, right before Easter, on a Wednesday night service, we'll, we'll, we'll do our remembrance of the broken body of Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed for us, and we kind of have... Our, our memorial of that. And um, we do that once every year around the time of when the Passover would have been to, to which I believe is when, you know, I'm not going to get into all the reasons why we do that. It's a whole other sermon. But when we take communion, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to start reading in verse number 27. 
we're going to see very clearly that it's up to everybody who's gathered or assembled to decide for themselves whether or not they're going to participate in this. And he's not closing it off and saying only, only the members of this church, if you're visiting with us, you cannot participate. If you're, and, and they go as far as if you're a Baptist brider and you go to a different church that believes exactly the same way as them and you're visiting from that church, you still can't participate in it because you're not a member of that church. It's crazy. I mean, that's just, talk about take, taking things just way extreme and way overboard. This is what you end up with when, when you just go down way too far in, into, uh, into areas where the Bible's not that clear and explicit about, and they just, just run with it and, and, go, and go overboard. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So this is a very serious thing when you're participating in communion if you're going to be unworthily participating in that. And people... We'll, we'll even say this a little bit. He says some people get sick and die because they're participating unworthily. All right, so it's a very serious thing. But look what he says in verse 28. But let a man examine himself. No one else examines you. Let the man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread, of that bread, excuse me, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the, Lord, the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. This is a teaching from the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth and instructing them, because they were doing things wrong with communion, on how to do them right. Notice he didn't say, only the members of your church that have been baptized by an official person who's been ordained to baptize that has a pedigree going back to, you know, someone that I baptized, I'll be back in this letter would just be, no, only this person can do it because that's the person that I laid hands on. And if they don't give it to you, then, you know, it's only for these members and no one else. He doesn't say any of that. He says, yeah, the people in your congregation, let them judge for themselves. Let every man, you know, examine himself. He didn't give an instruction to the elder of the church at Corinth saying, okay, now make sure that no one else gets this except for these people and instruct them that only members of our church, local assembly can. He doesn't say any of that. Watch out for people who want to create doctrines and make things some really strict rules on areas where the Bible is not explicitly clear in that direction. I, I think there's many areas of service to the Lord where there's definitely guiding principles and there's guiding rules and we have enough information on how to do things that's going to be acceptable unto the Lord. But the areas where it's left a little bit more loose or free or open, don't start adding your own rules to it and, and, and teaching uh, the commandments of man as the commandments of God or teaching doctrine of man as a commandment of God. Don't, don't, you know, we can't go down that road. And unfortunately, that's what the, what the Baptist writers end up doing here. And, um, but now I want to switch gears a little bit. And it's somewhat related, but I kind of wanted to cover both of these topics today. And neither one felt to me like an entire full-length sermon. But here's one that may be even more interesting for you. And this is tied in with, you know, because they have this whole pedigree thing and who can be ordained and who could even preach and stuff like that. And it's based on um, their biblical authority. And what, and what they'll say is that church doesn't have authority because it didn't follow the succession, right? So there's just zero authority. You can't be a legitimate church unless you follow the, the, the succession that, that they put their stamp of approval on. But what about this is who should be able to perform baptisms? Right? And I've had this question come up before, and it's a good question. I've thought about this quite a bit, uh, especially you know, quite a while ago. I, I, I've been settled on this for a while, but um, it's a very good question. And you know what? It's also one that you don't have an explicit answer to in the Scripture. And it is a perfect example because this is an area where I believe, there, I mean, there's definitely a truth, right? There's, de there's definitely a right and a wrong answer on who can do who can perform baptisms. But there's also a little bit of ambiguity 
and unclearness because it's not explicitly stated as like a doctrine as a fact like only this these people can do it so what we have to do is go off of the principles and go off of all the information that we have to make a decision on what's appropriate and what's right one of the things that you'll find as we read scripture is that the only people performing baptisms are the apostles the disciples elders and people who have been ordained now just based off of that without a clear statement that's the guidance one part of the guidance that i take from what i would determine to say who should be actually performing the baptism but i'll also say this because i don't think we should get so down a path of saying well if you got baptized you know of just starting to delegitimize people's baptisms based on who is the person who performed the baptism and there's a good reason for that too because what, what we're going to see what hopefully what you'll see is the purpose for not having an explicit instruction on who can perform the baptism is because the baptism isn't about the person doing the baptizing their role is very small and not important. Now, there's a proper way of doing things, and you don't want to just have just everybody out there just, oh, you're baptized now. I mean, think about the chaos that you could have in a church. You get this brand new convert, brand new believer, you know, and they're all fired up and they want to go soul winning and they're going out and they're coming back and they say, oh, I had 10 people saved today and I, you know, and I'll just baptize you right now because, it's not, you know, and, and they start doing all this stuff. And it's like sometimes people need to just be a little, you know, get their zeal checked and add some knowledge to it because you don't want to just get too far off into, into areas that's it's just not, you know, it's not right. So there needs to be people who have experience and knowledge and can discern even whether or not you should be baptizing someone, right? Everyone that we baptize here, I ask them, you know, why they're saved, if they know they're saved, and, and, and question them on that because that's the requirement for getting baptized. But people who are really new to soul winning or really new believers, oftentimes they don't really know even how to, you know, based on someone's answers, they may not even always know whether or not that person is is saved like just because it, it can be harder to get to the heart when you ask sim like more simple questions and and just through experience you start to learn oh okay well when they say this answer it may sound like they're saved but like we, it, this is just kind of a red flag you ask a few more questions you realize oh okay this person isn't even really saved right they're they're thinking whatever and i've said this before you know when i first got saved i used to think that all denominations were saved that I just, and you know, yeah, they had their differences, but I just kind of thought that everybody who claimed Christianity was saved. And when I came to the realization of just, oh, wow, Jesus Christ is the Savior, and he became, you know, I put my trust in him, that was an ignorant view because I just assumed that, well, everyone is believing in Christ. Now I've joined as being a believer, regardless of which church I'm going to. But, and many people have that same view the same mindset, but as you go out and start talking to people and realizing, oh no, actually what they're believing about salvation is not what the Bible says at all, and they may claim the name of Christ, but it's just completely off, you start realizing they're not saved. So again, the, the, the purpose for having somebody being able to perform the baptism is so that you can do it decently and in order, which is how a church ought to run. Now, in John chapter 4, when we look at who should perform baptism, turn if you would to Acts chapter 8. That's where I'm going to spend the most time is in Acts 8. John 4, the Bible tells us in verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. So it's talking about, obviously, John the Baptist, we know, was the first person actually performing baptisms. Prior to that, no one was getting baptized. It was a new thing in the New Testament. John the Baptist was the first one, and he was ordained by God to do that job. I mean, that was his role, his job. He was told and given instructions by God to do what he was doing, okay? And he baptized Jesus Christ. But then when Jesus came on the scene and started his ministry, 
his ministry started seeing a lot more baptisms even than John's ministry. And John made a big, you know, splash, if you will. Uh, uh, you know, no pun intended there. But he was, he was causing a big stir, a big commotion, because he was different, and the Pharisees were going out to see him and stuff. But then Jesus came on the scene, and, and, and their influence grew even more. And they got, started gathering a lot more followers, and a lot more people were being baptized. And that's what the Bible says in John 4, 1, that... The Lord knew the Pharisees heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, but it's very careful to add this parenthetical statement in verse 2, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. So we see, first of all, Jesus wasn't doing the baptizing. The disciples were. Now, I bring that up, and I think it's important to bring that up, and I believe he didn't do it because he didn't want people getting confused on, well, I got baptized by Jesus as opposed by anyone else. And he didn't want that to become a stumbling block because there's still some people even today that will believe that if you're not baptized, you're not saved, right? And they tie in that with salvation. And I think Jesus obviously very wisely would have not done that just because he didn't want them people to think that that had anything to do with their salvation since they're already accepting him and believing on him, right? And then you got people, oh, well, I got baptized by Jesus. Well, I just got baptized by John or whatever. Um, Jesus himself was not doing the baptizing uh, Philip, we see, is someone... Now, obviously, John the Baptist was doing baptizing. Jesus' disciples were baptizing people, and that's what it says here. His disciples were baptizing. So this would be, you know, um, the, the, the 12 disciples, um, probably some more, but they all would have been told to do the baptism by Jesus Christ. So they've been ordained by Jesus to do baptisms. We see Philip in Acts chapter 8, Right? Acts 8, verse number 5 says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I preached on... Um, what did I preach on? Oh, the, 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 the people, the deacons. I preached a sermon on deacons. And I was saying how I believe that there was a, the seven people that were selected for the daily ministration were deacons that were being assigned by that, that huge church. Um that they had to do these other tasks. Philip was one of the people in that list, just like Stephen was. And these are great men of God, right? So Philip was one of those people who was ordained to do a job in the church. And I believe he was ordained to be a deacon. Doesn't say specifically he was a deacon, but whatever. Um, he was definitely ordained. He was definitely chosen as a man that was full of faith and, and had these qualifications to do the job that they wanted him to do. And Philip is another one that's mentioned. And you could go through, there's not very many people listed as who's doing baptizing in the scripture. So if you're going to try to see examples of it, these are the examples you're going to find. And Philip goes and he's, he's preaching the gospel. Verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And we don't know who specifically is doing the baptizing there, except... We know that Philip is the one that went down to Samaria, and, and based on the context of the story, it sounds like he's there by himself. And he's like waiting, still waiting to meet up with other people and everything else, but he went down here to do some soul winning and ends up baptizing these people. Verse 13 says, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So now the apostles start to hear of the work that Philip's doing down there in Samaria, and they send apostles down there to check it out. And it says in verse 15, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Philip's down there, and he doesn't have the power to lay hands on people and give them the, the power of the Holy Ghost. There were certain people who had that gift of being able, and that was the apostles, that were able to give people gifts of the Holy Ghost, you know, to be able to speak with other tongues and the healing and everything else that, that, you, that you, you read about of gifts that were given of the Holy Ghost. Through laying on of the apostles' hands, they were able to give those gifts. Philip was not capable of doing that because he hadn't done that, but he was still getting people saved and baptized. So he was ordained to do those things, but he did not have the ability to do that. And then, of course, we know that um, that guy, Simon, wants to have that power also. And they're like, no, and, and his heart, you know, whatever, all that stuff. I'm not getting into that. Let's jump down to verse 35, because this is another famous passage here with Philip. 
Uh, it says in verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And this is one of those verses where people want to say, Oh, well, I mean, Philip just, I mean, the guy just asked to be baptized. So Philip just went down and he baptized him. But Philip was ordained. I mean, Philip was an ordained leader in the church that was doing the baptism. And it's not that you have to set up a special time to baptize someone. Hey, if someone get baptized right away, amen. But this would be like if I was out soul winning and I had an opportunity to baptize someone, I would just be able to baptize them right away. Because I'm an ordained authority in a church that would carry out that baptism and it doesn't matter where I'm at. We don't have to set up a special time for it. We could just do it. But I do not believe that this is something that just anybody should just be taken upon themselves to do baptisms. Now, but I'll, I'll also say this. Look, turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's the last place I have you turn. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because this is also where we see the teaching that the person doing the baptizing isn't all that important. Now, while I do think, for, for the reasons I already stated, for things to be done decently in order, there, you ought to have specific people within the church that are doing the baptisms, people who've been ordained and appointed to do the baptisms. And that's for very good reasons to just make sure you're not just ruining a testimony even of an entire church because you're just baptizing people willy-nilly and just, you know, oh, whatever, we'll just baptize you here. You know, it's like, hold on a second there. You know, let's, let's make sure everything is being done properly. And people who have already been chosen as, being, as, as having knowledge and, and, and not being a novice and, and being able to do these things, you know, it makes sense for those people to be the ones performing the baptism. Because they're the leaders, right? And they're, and they're the ones that are put in that position. It doesn't mean that other people aren't smart enough or capable of doing it. It's just, hey, these, let's just do things and follow a, a set order, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, which is another great passage, by the way, for showing people that baptism is not required for salvation. Verse 12 says, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am a Paul and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. So we see here that the Apostle Paul really wasn't doing many baptisms personally. Now, there was other people appointed to do these baptisms, but at, at Corinth, he wasn't the one going down into the water and performing his baptism. He did it a few times, right? He, he, he names here Crispus, Gaius. But he's saying, I thank God that he didn't baptize anyone. Why? I mean, if, bapt if baptism was required for salvation, why in the world would we be saying, well, I'm just glad I didn't baptize you then. So you could all just die and go to hell. No, <laughs> because baptism isn't required for, for, for entrance into heaven. He's saying this because he said, well, I don't want anyone just thinking I'm lifting myself up so much that now I'm baptizing people in my own name. No, you're getting baptized in the name of Jesus because he's the Savior, not in his own name. And he says, and I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And you know, my job, what I've been focusing on is just going out and preaching the gospel. We've got other guys back here that can help and do these baptisms, right? Go get baptized. Because if you're out preaching the gospel, there's not water everywhere. Right? John the Baptist was in Enon because there was much water there and he was able to perform the baptisms and preach and do his ministry when there's water around him. But Paul was going all over the place, right? And when he's going out soul winning, it's not like you just had water everywhere to baptize people. So he's saying, you know what? I'm going to be focused on doing the soul winning. And hey, you need, you're saved now. You need to go get baptized. So go over here by this body of water where we've got people you know, ready to baptize you and I'm going to keep going and hitting these doors, right? So he's not like stopping. Okay, let's all walk over here now. We'll baptize you and then go back. It doesn't make any sense. 
So I say all that because it's not like, oh, well, the, I want the Apostle Paul to baptize me. And I've seen this, and I understand when people have a, a, an emotional tie to someone because they were real influential in their life, and, oh, can you baptize me? But at the end of the day, you know what? It doesn't matter who baptizes you. Jesus wasn't baptizing people personally. The Apostle Paul was saying, you know, I'm glad I didn't baptize people personally because he didn't want to be lifted up to a... Um, you know, to an um, inappropriate degree or anything, or, or anyone even be able to say that he was baptizing people in his own name. It's not the person that's doing the baptism that matters. And I don't think that's what God views as being, whether it's acceptable or not. It's you taking that, that step of obedience to do a public display that you're um, putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, and that step of obedience. Now, it's a command to be baptized. And the word baptism literally means immersion. So we believe in people getting completely dunked underwater to, to illustrate and, and show how our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again three days later. And that's the symbolism behind the act of a baptism is when you go into the water, it, it demonstrates the death and, and burial of Jesus Christ. But then coming back up out of the water is like Jesus coming up out of the grave in his resurrection. And you doing that in front of, you know, who, it doesn't matter how many people. It doesn't have to be in front of an entire group and a whole church. And if it wasn't for the whole church, it's not legitimate. It could be in front of one person. But the point is, it's for God. It's showing your faith outwardly to God that, yes, I'm going to die to self just as Jesus died on the cross, and I'm going to walk in newness of life, and this is what I'm going to do. That's what it's about. It's not about the person doing the, the actual dunking because it's not like they have magic hands or say magic words, and it's like, now, now that's legit. And here's the thing. If it really mattered who was doing it, I mean, think about it. Like, you think God wants you worried about, oh man, this person baptized me, but then it comes out like much later, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right? If someone, it, like, think about reprobates or people that sneak in, they creep in, they get positions, and they get ordained, and they get, you know, they become part of the church, and they're doing these baptisms for years, and then it all of a sudden finds out, man, that guy was a pervert, that guy's a, you know, whatever. They're out. So now you just have to do all these re baptisms again? Well, that didn't count. None of you accounted for. Well, this guy already died and he got, you know, well, God never viewed it as legitimate, even though you didn't know that he was a bad guy or whatever. That's silly. Okay, that's ridiculous. That's taking things too far. It's on the one hand, should you have the right people performing a baptism? I do believe you should. I believe it should be someone who's ordained or whatever, that it's not just out of order of just everybody taking it on themselves and just baptizing people and you've got new believers just starting to baptize roommates and other people and stuff when they're not even really grounded and settled and, 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 and you know, grown enough to, to understand more fully some of the deeper things, right? And, and be able to, to do that. Because, I mean, it's like the people who get baptized like, to try like all these different religions and stuff. It's like, Pretty soon it just becomes pointless and meaningless. I mean, I've no, you know, some people, great, amen, if they've been through a bunch of false religions, but then they finally get it right and they get baptized, amen, that's great. But you know, some people are just doing it because they're just like trying out each one. And I think that some people just might want to have their bases covered and just be like, well, I just tried, you know, like, like I was a member of all these different churches. One of them's got to be right. And, but, but the more you do it, just diminishes the whole meaning and purpose of it. Right? It's just, it, it's kind of, so there's a good reason to have someone who's ordained doing the baptism, performing it. Is it some hard, fast rule? No, you can't point to scripture and say it's some hard, fast rule. So if somebody ended up being baptized by someone else that wasn't ordained, right? Maybe someone lives in some area and it's just kind of remote and there's really no churches there. There's no one preaching the right gospel, but they ended up getting saved through someone, passing through whatever, and that person baptized them. Is that just going to be like, well, God's just going to curse you now because you didn't do things right? No, I don't believe that for a second. I would still, I would say that, you know what? You got baptized by the, you know, maybe the best person or whoever was around to be able to do it. Um, and I don't think you should just wait if you want to get baptized, I, you know, you should do your best to try to get it done in a way that's, that's the most real or optimal. But, 
I mean, let's face it, if, if people had, there's unique situations and kind of weird, you know, exceptions to the rule where I don't think God's just going to be like, nope, sorry, I'm not recognizing the, the, the fact that you wanted to go through with this and, and got baptized because that person just was not the right person. So while I don't recommend just anyone going out and baptizing at the same time, I'm not saying that it's, you know, it's not that important on who's doing it. And how does this tie in with the Baptist Brider? Well, because we need to take the biblical approach and not go off the deep end on any doctrine. Because you can start taking things to weird extremes. And, then, and that's where you're going to end up with, okay, now we've got to rebaptize the whole church. And then you're going to end up having baptisms every, you know, like, our baptism numbers are going to be exceeding our soul winning numbers <laughs> because you're going to be finding all these faults and flaws and, oh, this person did it. And, you know, now you need to do this. And I've heard people, like, you need to be, if you want to be a member of our church, you've got to get rebaptized at our church where they don't recognize other churches. This, that's part of the Baptist Brider belief, too. Like, if you come from another Baptist church that wasn't a Baptist brider and you want to join their church, I'm pretty confident that's what it is. This is just based off of memory now. I didn't, I didn't do the research on this. I just thought about this now because I remember that coming up before, too, where I, someone was telling me that they had to get rebaptized at that church. Even though they'd been saved, they have a testimony of being saved, they, you know, like, they had... They had gotten baptized in a, you know, just a different Baptist church, but it wasn't a Baptist bride or church and they had to get re-baptized in that church or else they couldn't even be a member of the church. And that's taking things too far and that's just, just weird and that's going to lead you into other weird doctrines. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, your words and I pray that you would please just help us to have good doctrine and have sound doctrine, Lord, and that we would follow um, the example set forth in Scripture, especially when it comes to church and administration so that we're doing everything decently and in order. Lord, help us to continue to learn, and I pray that you would please just open up our, our minds to understand the truth more every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.